Chapter Nine of Maria Chapdelaine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ligny. Maria Chapdelaine by Louis Emon, translated by W. H. Blake. Chapter Nine, One Thousand Aves. Since the coming of winter, they had often talked at the Chapdelaines about the holidays and now these were drawing near i am wondering whether we shall have any callers on new year's day said madame chapdelaine one evening she went over the list of all relatives and friends able to make the venture as alma la rouche does not live so far away but she she is not very energetic the people at st prime would not mean to take the journey possibly wilfred or ferdinand might drive from st gedeon if the ice on the lake were in good condition a sigh disclosed that she still was dreaming of the coming and going in the old parishes at the time of the new year the family dinners the unlooked-for visits of kindred arriving by sleigh from the next village buried under rugs and furs behind a horse whose coat was white with frost maria's thoughts were turning in another direction if the roads are as bad as they were last year said she we shall not be able to attend the midnight mass and yet i should so much have liked it this time and father promised through the little window they looked on the gray sky and found little to cheer them to go to midnight mass is the natural and strong desire of every french canadian peasant even of those living farthest from the settlements what do they not face to accomplish it arctic cold the woods at night obliterated roads great distances do but add to the impressiveness and the mystery this anniversary of the birth of jesus is more to them than a mere fixture in the calendar with rites appropriate it signifies the renewed promise of salvation an occasion of deep rejoicing and those gathered in the wooden church are imbued with sincerest fervor are pervaded with a deep sense of the supernatural this year more than ever maria yearned to attend the mass after many weeks of remoteness from houses and from churches the favors she would fain demand seemed more likely to be granted were she able to prefer them before the altar aided in heavenward flight by the wings of music but toward the middle of december much snow fell dry and fine as dust and three days before christmas the northwest wind arose and made an end of the roads on the morrow of the storm chapdelaine harnessed charles eugene to the heavy sleigh and departed with tipe they took shovels to clear the way or lay out another route the two men returned by noon worn out white with snow asserting that there would be no breaking through for several days the disappointment must be borne maria sighed but the idea came to her that there might be other means of attaining the divine goodwill is it true mother she asked as evening was falling that if you repeat a thousand aves on the day before christmas you are always granted the thing you seek quite true her mother reverently answered one desiring a favor who says her thousand aves properly before midnight on christmas eve very seldom fails to receive what she asks on christmas eve the weather was cold but windless the two men went out betimes in another effort to beat down the road with no great hopes of success but long before they left and indeed long before daylight maria began to recite her aves awakening very early she took her rosary from beneath the pillow and swiftly repeated the prayer passing from the last word to the first without stopping and counting bead by bead the others were still asleep but Chian left his place at the stove when he saw that she moved and came to sit beside the bed gravely reposing his head upon the coverings maria's glance wandered over the long white muzzle resting upon the brown wool the liquid eyes filled with the dumb creature's pathetic trustfulness the drooping glossy ears while she ceased not to murmur the sacred words hail mary full of grace Soon Titbe jumped from bed to put wood upon the fire. 
an impulse of shyness caused Maria to turn away and hide her rosary under the coverlet as she continued to pray. The stove roared. Jean went back to his usual spot, and for another half-hour nothing was stirring in the house save the fingers of Maria numbering the boxwood beads and her lips as they moved rapidly in the task she had laid upon herself. Then must she arise, for the day was dawning, make the porridge and the pancakes while the men went to the stable to care for the animals, wait upon them when they returned, wash the dishes, sweep the house. What time she attended to these things, Maria was ever raising a little higher toward heaven the monument of her aves. But the rosary had to be laid aside, and it was hard to keep a true reckoning. As the morning advanced, however, no urgent duty calling, she was able to sit by the window, and steadily pursue her undertaking. Noon, and already three hundred aves. Her anxiety lessens, for now she feels almost sure of finishing in time. It comes to her mind that fasting would give a further title to heavenly consideration, and might, with reason, turn hopes into certainties. Wherefore, she ate but little, forgoing all those things she liked the best. Throughout the afternoon, she must knit the woolen garment designed for her father as a New Year's gift. And though the faithful repetition ceased not, the work of her fingers was something of a distraction and a delay. Then came the long preparations for supper, and finally Titbe brought his mittens to be mended. So all this time the Avis made slow and impeded progress, like some devout procession brought to halt by secular interruption. But when it was evening and the tasks of the day were done, she could resume her seat by the window, where the feeble light of the lamp did not invade the darkness, look forth upon the fields hidden beneath their icy cloak, take the rosary once more in her hands, and throw her heart into the prayer. She was happy that so many aves were left to be recited, since labor and difficulty could only add merit to her endeavor. Even did she wish to humble herself further, and give force to her prayer by some posture that would bring uneasiness and pain, by some chastening of the flesh. Her father and Titbe smoked, their feet against the stove. Her mother sewed new ties to old moose hide moccasins. Outside, the moon had risen, flooding the chill whiteness with colder light, and the heavens were of a marvelous purity and depth, sown with stars that shone like that wondrous star of old. Blessed art thou amongst women. Through repeating the short prayer, oftentimes and quickly she grew confused, and sometimes stopped, her dazed mind lost among the well-known words. It is only for a moment. Sighing, she closes her eyes, and the phrase which rises at once to her memory and her lips ceases to be mechanical, detaches itself, again stands forth in all its hallowed meaning. Blessed art thou amongst women. At length a heaviness weighs upon her, and the holy words are spoken with greater effort and slowly. Yet the beads pass through her fingers in endless succession, and each one launches the offering of an ave to that sky, where Mary, the compassionate, is surely seated on her throne, hearkening to the music of prayers that ever rise, and brooding over the memory of that blessed night. The Lord's with thee. The fence-rails were very black, upon the white expanse, palely lighted by the moon. Trunks of birch-trees, standing against a dark background of forest, were like the skeletons of living creatures, smitten with the cold and stricken by death. But the glacial night was awesome, rather than a frightening. But the roads as they are, we will not be the only ones who have to stay at home this evening, said Madame Chapdelaine. But is there anything more lovely than the midnight mass at saint coeur de marie with Yvonne Boilly playing the harmonium, and Pacific Simard who sings the Latin so beautifully? She was very careful to say nothing that might seem reproachful or complaining on such a night as this, but in spite of herself, the words and tone had a sad ring of loneliness and remoteness. Her husband noticed it, and, himself under the influence of the day, was quick to take the blame. It is true enough, Laura, that you would have had a happier life with some other man than me, 
who lived on a comfortable farm near the settlements. No, Samuel, what the good God does is always right. I grumble. Of course I grumble. Is there any one who hasn't something to grumble about? But we have never been unhappy, we two. We have managed to live without faring over badly. The boys are fine boys, hard-working, who bring us nearly all they earn. Maria, too, is a good girl. Affected by these memories of the past, they also were thinking of the candles already lit, of the hymns soon to be raised in honor of the Savior's birth. Life had always been a simple and a straightforward thing for them, severe but inevitable toil, a good understanding between man and wife, obedience alike to the laws of nature and of the church. Everything was drawn into the same roof, the rites of their religion and the daily routine of existence so woven together that they could not distinguish the devout emotion possessing them from the mute love of each for each. Little Alma Rose heard praises in the air and hastened to demand her portion. I have been a good girl too, haven't I, father? Certainly, certainly. A black sin indeed if one were naughty on the day when the little Jesus was born. To the children, Jesus of Nazareth was ever the little Jesus, the curly-headed babe of the sacred picture. And in truth, for the parents as well, such was the image oftenest brought to mind by the name. Not the sad, enigmatic Christ of the Protestant, but a being more familiar and less august, a newborn infant in his mother's arms, or at least a tiny child who might be loved without great effort of the mind or any thought of the coming sacrifice. Would you like me to rock you? Yes! He took the little girl on his knees and began to swing her back and forth. And are we going to sing too? Yes! Very well, now sing with me. Dans son étable, que Jésus est charmant, qu'il est aimable dans son abaissement. He began in quiet tones that he might not drown the other's slender voice, but soon emotion carried him away, and he sang with all his might, his gaze dreamy and remote. Thales Ford drew near and looked at him with worshipping eyes. To these children, brought up in a lonely house, with only their parents for companions, Samuel Chapdelaine embodied all there was in the world of wisdom and might. As he was ever gentle and patient, always ready to take the children on his knee and sing them hymns, or those endless old songs he taught them one by one, they loved him with a rare affection. Tous les palais des rois n'ont rien de comparable au beauté que je vois dans cette table. Once more, very well. This time, the mother and Titbe joined in. Maria could not resist saying her prayers for a few moments, that she might look and hurt him. But the words of the hymn renewed her order, and she soon took up the task again with a livelier faith. Hail Mary, full of grace. Toi qu'on navire sont arrivés, charge d'avoine, charge de bleu. Nous irons sur le, nous y prom promener, nous irons jouer de l'île. And now, another song? Which? Without waiting for a reply, he struck in. No, not that one. Claire Fontaine? Ah, that's a beautiful one, that is. We shall all sing it together. He glanced at Maria, but seeing the beads ever slipping through her fingers, he would not intrude. À la Claire Fontaine, mon allant promener, je trouve l'eau si belle que je m'y suis baigné. Il y a longtemps que je t'aime, je m'en je ne t'oublierai. Words and tune alike haunting, the unaffected sadness of the refrain lingering in the ear, the song that well may find its way to any heart. Sur la plus haute branche, le rossignol chantait. Chante, rossignol, chante, toi qui as le cœur gai. Il y a longtemps que je t'aime, je m'ai, je ne t'oublierai. The rosary lay still in the long fingers. Maria did not sing with the others, but she was listening and this lament of a love that was unhappy fell very sweetly and movingly on her spirit, a little weary with prayer. Tu as le coeur à rire, moi je l'ai pleuré, j'ai perdu ma maîtresse, sans pouvoir la retrouver. Pour un bouquet de roses que je lui refusais, il y a longtemps que je t'aime, je m'aime, je ne t'oublierai. 
Marie looked through the window at the white field circled by mysterious forest, the passion of religious feeling, the tide of young love rising within her, the sound of the familiar voices fused in her heart to a single emotion. Truly, the world was filled with love that evening, with love, human and divine, simple in nature and mighty in strength, one and the other most natural and right, so intermingled that the beseeching of heavenly favor upon dear ones was scarcely more than the expression of an earthly affection, while the artless love-songs were chanted with solemnity of voice and exaltation of spirit, fit for addresses to another world. Je voudrais que la rose fût encore au rosier, et que le rosier même à la mer fût jeté. Il y a longtemps que je t'aime, je m'ai, je ne t'oublierai. Hail Mary, full of grace. The song ended. Maria forthwith resumed her prayers with zeal refreshed, and once again the tale of the Aves mounted. Little Alma rose, asleep on her father's knee, was undressed and put to bed. Telesphore followed. Titbe arose in turn, stretched himself, and fined the stove with green birch logs. The father made a last trip to the stable, and came back running, saying that the cold was increasing. Soon all had retired, save Maria. You won't forget to put out the lamp? No, father. Forthwith she quenched the light, preferring it so, and seated herself again by the window, to repeat the last avis. When she had finished, a scruple assailed her, and a fear, lest she had erred in the reckoning, because it had not always been possible to count the beads of her rosary. Out of prudence, she recited yet another fifty, and then was silent-jaded, weary, but full of happy confidence, as though the moment had brought her a promise inviolable. The world outside was lit, wrapped in that first splendor which the night unrolls over lands of snow, when the sky is clear and the moon is shining. Within the house was darkness, and it seemed that wood and field had illumined themselves to signal the coming of the holy hour. The thousand of us have been said, murmured Maria to herself, but I have not yet asked for anything, not in words. She had thought that perhaps it were not needful, that the divinity might understand without hearing wishes shaped by lips, Mary above all, who had been a woman upon earth. But at the last her simple mind was taken with a doubt, and she tried to find speech for the favor she was seeking. François Paradis Most surely it concerns François Paradis. Hast thou already guessed it, O Mary, full of grace? How might she frame this her desire without impiety, that he should be spared hardship in the woods, that he should be true to his word, and give up drinking and swearing, that he return in the spring. That he return in the spring. She goes no further, for it seems to her that when he is with her again, his promise kept, all the happiness in the world must be within their reach, unaided, almost unaided, if it be not presumptuous so to think. That he return in the spring. Dreaming of his return, of François, the handsome, sunburnt face turned to hers, Maria forgets all else, and looks long, with unseen eyes, at the snow-covered ground, which the moonlight has turned into a glittering fabric of ivory and mother-of-pearl, at the black pattern of the fences outlined upon it, and the menacing ranks of the dark forest. End of chapter 9